What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are here with the Children of the Vault, and this story is so amazing. But what this does here is this picks up with Cable. Technically, the Children of the Vault do appear a little bit earlier than this, but we'll kind of wrap back around to them and make everything make sense once we pick up with their characters. The thing to understand about Cable is he's actually been held prisoner for a month, and that's one of the reasons why for a lot of you all who are following the X-Men comics and you were wondering whatever happened to Cable, this is where he's been. But the whole reason why he's being held captive, specifically by Orcus, right, the giant anti-mutant organization that's out there, is because remember, Cable's a time traveler. He comes from the future. So them having access to everything he knows about the past, the present, the future, it's the Rosetta Stone, right? It would allow them to know what's going to happen and to basically avoid those pitfalls and ensure they come out on top. The other thing they've done here is they've stolen his mechanical arm, which in all honesty, is just kind of a crappy thing to do, but it is advanced technology. So it would make sense. They would take it in their possession. The other part of this is that even though Cable is an Omega level telepath, meaning he's one of the most powerful telepaths in existence that he stays confined within what's basically a thought bubble in the sense that Orcus has constructed a kind of thought prison where he can't control the minds of other people. Now, in reality, he is an Omega level telepath and telekinetic. He is exceedingly powerful. But the funny thing here is we're kind of given this bit of a narration where we're told that like Cable would escape on his own within three days. Instead, he's rescued by none other than Bishop. Now, for those of you guys you don't know the significance behind this, right? Like, let's kind of step away from this comic book for a second. I promise what I'm about to tell you is amazing. It's, you're going to absolutely love this, right? So something to understand is that Cable and Bishop both come from the future, but they come from two separate universes. Cable comes from a future where the villain apocalypse had taken over the world and ruled with an iron fist. Bishop comes from a future where an event transpired known as the Six Minute War. So here's how these two are linked, right? In Marvel Comics, in the aftermath of House of M during the Decimation Era, in a story that's specifically titled Messiah Complex, Hope Summers was born, and she was the first mutant born after the Scarlet Witch took away 98% of the mutant population's powers. It was a huge deal. There was a mad dash to find this girl. The X-Men were trying to find her, Mr. Sinister and his Marauders were trying to find them, and then William Stryker and his Purifiers were trying to find them. When they all got to the village that Hope's signal was detected at in Alaska, basically the village had been burned to the ground and everybody was dead and so nobody knew where hope summers went to come to find out cable had snatched her up and then started skipping through the timeline and the reason why was because bishop was chasing them that in bishop's future hope summers grows up to just become this like crazy powerful but more or less villainous girl who wiped out a million humans in six minutes and that basically jump starts like the sentinel program and more or less leads to days of future past the difference is that in what was called the Summer's Rebellion, humans and mutants banded together and then overthrew the Sentinels. But Bishop was always trying to find a way to keep his future from coming into existence. Once he realized it was hope, Cable fled with hope, Bishop chased after them, and the two of them had just been enemies for years and years and years. So the fact that like Bishop rescues Cable is a big deal here, right? So jumping back to the story itself, I told you it was cool. The X-Men in the mid 2000s were amazing. We need to go back and just kind of cover that. Maybe we'll like dedicate a day so we don't confuse everybody with Fall of X. But the thing about this is that Cable and Bishop have a very tenuous alliance here. And in fact, one of the things that happens is that as soon as Cable is basically released from his captivity, he uses his telepathy and takes over the minds of the soldiers who were shooting at them and basically convince them or at least trick them into believing that they're actually spies for Krakoa. And so they're kind of like their own personal army. Now for Bishop himself, his ability is that he can kind of absorb any form of energy and then channel it back in the form of a concussive blast. There are limits. For example, if like Galactus were to attack Bishop, he wouldn't be able to absorb that much power. But somebody like Cyclops or Gunfire or something along those lines, absolutely. And so of course, he's able to offer some measure of a defense as well. But using their own telepathically manipulated private army, they effectively flee and then they ultimately escape. And so one of the things that happens here is that Cable does not know about the events that went into the fall of X, which is to say Orcus launching a strike against a mutant population, Nimrod having seemingly killed Juggernaut and then believed to have killed Iceman, that all these mutants were sent away from Earth by Xavier, kind of forced to do that, that he doesn't know about any of that stuff. And so reading the mind of Bishop, he gets caught up 
super fast. And the two of them basically take off. Now, we'll find out where they went to, but what we do here is we actually switch over to the Children of the Vault themselves. Now, the great thing about this is that within the comic, the nature of the children is explained incredibly well. And so what they do is they address the whole of humanity and they say, humankind, do not be afraid. I am Serafina of the Voice of the City, and we are the Children of Tomorrow. They had kind of changed their name. They used to be called the Children of the Vault. But she basically says, we speak to you now where you are in your own language. Our words are gifts are for everyone. When our ancestors left you, they understood that humankind was on a road to self-destruction, that you would need answers faster than you could hope to find them. They lock themselves away in a place where time moves faster. Though only a few decades passed for you, our society has progressed a thousand thousand years, right? And so she says, war, ecological catastrophe, disease, prejudice, poverty, and pain. For us, this is the stuff of ancient history. We solved your problems generations ago. We wish to share our solutions with you, all of you, freely. We have already begun. Now, Here's the thing to understand here. Despite the fact that Serafina presents herself and the other children of the vault as saviors, in reality, they're anything but. For those of you guys who aren't familiar with how the X-Men were being handled by Jonathan Hickman during House and Powers of X, one of the things he established is that at some point in the future, the children of the vault will go to war with humanity and the mutant population, and they will win. They will annihilate all of them. And in fact, the children of the vault and humanity will merge and become what we're called post-humans, and then they would eventually go off and do their own thing and merge with the phalanx and so on and so forth. But the thing about this is they are basically nefarious, and it's a smart thing to do. What better way to conquer a land than to appear as a savior, earn the trust of the people, and then slowly subvert them from the inside out? And in fact, that's exactly what they do, right? We're literally told, in the poorest places on Earth, self-replicating technology 10,000 years ahead of its time unfolds and ingratiates itself. Buildings composed of brand new elements spring up overnight, consuming and converting the already existing architecture as raw material. Bizarre new skylines threaten virgin skies. People begin to call them Pueblos de Manana, or Tomorrow Towns, right? Basically, they're giving people technology and resources that can actually improve their lives. They give people resources and technology that heals them, restores the ability to walk to those who lost it, right? They step in and they end like natural disasters that are threatening to wipe out entire towns. They very much appear as saviors. And that's the power of the Children of Tomorrow because the other half of this equation that Serafina didn't necessarily mention is that with each new generation of the Children of Tomorrow, they become more advanced than the previous generation. Their powers multiply several times over again. So I would go so far as to argue that while they're not specifically listed as being like Omega level threats, they all basically are, right? I mean, sure, they don't necessarily have like crazy advanced reality warping powers, but they are incredibly capable. Now, the funny thing about this is that you initially have Orcus watching all of this unfold. And while Orcus was the organization that launched the strike against the mutant population and really kicked off the events of Fall of X in the first place, they do nothing when it comes to the children of tomorrow. One part of it is just due to the level of power they have. If they were to challenge the children of tomorrow right now, they would get destroyed, right? They would just, I mean, just like that. It wouldn't even be a challenge at all. The other reason though, is because if society is looking over there, there's nobody looking over here. And if there's nobody looking here, nobody's paying attention to what you're doing, right? So why look a gift horse in the mouth? Let things just play out, keep an eye on it, but it's all basically working to the favor of Orcus because with the children of tomorrow, the children of the vaults, whatever you want to call them, getting the attention of society, nobody's focused on Orcus. That also means like the Avengers and any other superhero teams who are out there are watching them. They're not watching Orcus slowly taking over the world. And so what you end up doing here is you basically pick up with Cable and Bishop 
friendship as they arrive in Hell's Kitchen, New York. And one of the things that Cable reveals is that he's just kind of going through and he's looking at people's minds, right? Reading their minds to a degree. And in fact, he even reads the mind of one guy who refers to him as Josh Brolin, right? Obviously a play on the fact that Josh Brolin played Cable in Deadpool 2. But what he ends up revealing here is that he also has a safe house, right? And of course, he always has safe houses. Cable has safe houses everywhere, right? They're all composed of ridiculously advanced technology based out of his spaceship, Grey Malkin, but like really his time travel ship. But he has all kinds of these things. And what he starts to do is actually rebuild his arm. But basically, you get like all these crazy levels of like arms and armament, like spaceships and so on and so forth. For Bishop, one of the things we learn is that the way in which he survived undetected was by resorting back to his own childhood, right? Kind of revisiting that bit of an origin story to a degree during the time before the Summer's Rebellion, when Bishop was living in that future, he has the M on his face because that's the brand that you got if you were a mutant. But operating underground, staying hidden from Sentinels, it was a very dark future to live in, but it's not that dissimilar to the one that he's living right now, even if only in relation to the fact that mutants are constantly being hunted by Orcus. I mean, it's not as dark in terms of the environment, right? He's not living in some post-apocalyptic wasteland where like all the superheroes that ever existed are dead and mutants are like fleeing for their lives and that kind of thing. It's not really that dark, right? I mean, it could get there, but it's not there yet. And so once Cable has his arm back, what he does is he actually tells Bishop he'd been reading his mind and something's off about his brain, right? Something's not quite right about his head. And what he tells him after scanning his brain is is that there's a spot on his mind. But the reason he missed this is that it doesn't use telepathy, which would be something that Cable would immediately be able to pick on. If, if Bishop was being controlled by some telepathic force out there, Cable would have figured it out in an instant and he would have overwhelmed that telepathic force, assuming it wasn't somebody on par with like Xavier or Emma Frost or something along those lines, right? Somebody comparable to him in power. But he even says, I don't know what it is that's going on there, but it's growing. And when Cable asked the question, like, what do you mean by a spot? Cable Cable breaks out his own little computer system in the form of a kind of AI nurse and then sort of asks it the question like diagnose this and tell me what you think it is. And what he realizes once he scans the analysis by the AI nurse is that this kind of virus or whatever you want to call it in the brain of Bishop is composed of a bunch of different organisms, right? There's the all god organism from the Dark Rain, the list, right? The Wolverine one shot comic. You've got Hawksbox, which is basically just some futuristic virus, right? Hex is the living corporation, the techno-organic virus itself, which converts living tissue into machinery. What's happening here is that this spot is basically a kind of egg, if we want to call it that. A virus, as Cable refers to it. What it's designed to do is eliminate individuality and instill absolute faith. In effect, what it does is it takes people and it puts them in the mindset where they see the children of tomorrow as their absolute saviors, and any sense of individuality begins to erode they see them as an absolute. Now, the fact that it also involves a techno-organic virus feeds into the post-human philosophy in the sense that once a group basically is infected by the techno-organic virus to an extent that there's no coming back, they'll basically create what's called a Babel Spire. That will summon the Phalanx Covenant to their planet, and the Phalanx Covenant will start to incorporate and assimilate all forms of organic and inorganic life and then move on to the next world. In essence, the children of tomorrow are setting humanity up to basically fall in line with a group think philosophy and then effectively become post-humans. They're fast tracking the conquering of the world. And it is an incredibly smart ploy to make because the world is already so fractured within the Marvel universe anyway, right? It would make perfect sense to make a move now if ever there were a time. Because if the phalanx does show up to Earth, no one's going to be able to stop them. No one can defeat them. Any mutant that could defeat them is either dead or missing. And in fact, in the Immortal X-Men comics, we find out where they're at. But it's just one of these things where the end of the world seemingly is nigh. A bunch of catastrophes happening at the same time. And in fact, that's what Cable says. As he's talking to Bishop, he says this virus spreads the way ideas spread, right? One person becomes a believer, another person becomes a believer, right? Basically, it's kind of spread throughout humanity as a whole. We don't know exactly how it's spread, right? We don't know like the method of transmission. We simply just know it goes from one person to the next. But every time people pick up news papers are looking at these headlines like humanity's existence has been extended to 150 years. Tomorrow, it might be 300.
300 years, right? It might double and then it might triple and so on and so forth to where people basically defy death. And so it's one of those things where he says, we're talking high level semiotic engineering. The technology, something like this would take, the children are the best bet of doing it. They're most likely the ones that are doing all of this. And so when Bishop asked the question, how far reaching is this virus? Cable looks out to everybody and realizes every human being he can see and presumably every human being on earth is infected. There's probably precious few who are not. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. If you need to get caught up on Fall of X, make sure you click this link to our playlist and I will catch you all later. Peace.